If you've ever tried to make your AI throw a projectile at an object, you've probably wished that you paid more attention in physics class. At least that's what happened to me. It gets even worse when you want to make that AI throw a projectile at a moving target. In this video, what we're going to do is take a look at how do we implement this magic math to make our AI pretty accurate whenever they're shooting a projectile at a moving player. We'll also talk about some enhancements to make your AI even scarier than what we covered in this video. Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you. Who, me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dreams become a reality by reteaching you something you've probably already learned in school. In all seriousness, this is a pretty hard problem to solve and I didn't find a lot of really good resources on how to do it. A lot of what you'll find is, hey, use these kinematic equations and that'll help you solve the projectile motion problem. But those aren't exactly what we need here because, well, all the time in those, you need to know at least three of displacement, initial velocity, final velocity, acceleration, or time and we actually only know two of those for sure. We want to calculate the initial strength required to throw a projectile some distance. We know the acceleration, but we don't know how long it's going to take to get there, and we don't know what the final velocity is going to be. We also don't know the height displacement that's going to happen unless we hard code that, which I saw in one of Sebastian's videos, which was very helpful, but I didn't want to have hard coded height because that introduces a bunch of other problems. One of those is if the AI always throws something to be the exact same height, it doesn't look very nice. Second one is in your level, probably you have varying heights that the AI needs to throw the ball within. So that solution didn't really work for me, which then made the kinematic equations not really very helpful for me because I only know now two of the three things that I would need to know to do those calculations. Luckily for us, our friend Wikipedia has a lot of information about projectile motion and has some equations that can help us out in this situation. It's actually a two-part problem. Number one is, how do I throw an object at a target when I don't know the initial velocity whenever that target is stationary? Once we can do that, then we can start talking about how do we hit a moving target. The way I want to position this is the AI I want to configure to have a maximum throw initial velocity so that way we can cap how hard they can throw it. So we want to solve what is the initial velocity it takes for me to throw this object from where I am to hit that target. That's what we're trying to solve. To solve this, we can use this equation, which is v squared divided by g equals y plus the square root of y squared plus x squared. That's still not exactly solved for initial velocity. So what all these are is v is the initial velocity, x is the displacement on the xz plane, y is a displacement on the y axis, and the g is the gravity as a positive number. This is hugely important. If you use the negative 9.8 that Unity gives you by default, you get really bad results here. Make sure it's a positive number. X being the displacement on the XZ plane is important because these equations are supposed to be in 2D space, but we're doing 3D space. So we're simplifying this by having the XZ plane displacement be X. Any movement, we can just set up a vector 2 velocity on XZ take the magnitude and that's the same as our x value here. And whenever we start actually implementing this, it's going to make a little bit more sense. We take this one step further to solve for v. We have v equals the square root of g times y plus the square root of y squared plus x squared. It's not the simplest equation, but we can work with that. The problem here is that v is going to be a float value. So that still doesn't really help us, right? Luckily for us, they have this other magic equation that if you look at Wikipedia, they show you how they get there. I'm taking the end result. And that is theta equals pi divided by two minus pi divided by two minus a divided by two, where theta is the angle that we have to throw an object at this particular force V that we said to hit that point. And in their equation, they have a, which is equal to y over x. I don't know why that was substituted out. It's okay if that doesn't totally make sense. It took me a little minute to get this, but the key takeaway here is that first equation with v equals a whole bunch of stuff, that's going to tell us the initial velocity that we have to throw something at, at this optimal angle that we get from the second equation to hit our target, which is exactly what we're looking for here. That allows us to, when we only know acceleration and the displacement, so that's the distance between our target and our enemy. What is the force required to throw from that point to that other point at this angle? 
So we only know two things. That's all we need to know. Perfect. So I'm going to translate this into a function called calculate grow data. So remember that the key fundamental here is we need to calculate the distance traveled on the X Z plane separately from the Y plane. First thing we're going to do is define a new vector three that has only the target position X and Z and uses the start position Y. Then we can easily calculate the Delta X Z, which is the distance traveled on the X Z plane and the Delta Y which is a distance traveled on the Y plane. We can do the Delta Y very easily by just subtracting the start position Y from the target position Y, and we know the distance traveled. The Delta XZ we get by simply taking the magnitude of that vector minus the start position. And since we only need to know from these formulas, the displacement and the gravity, we can start implementing that equation to calculate what is the initial velocity required. What we're gonna do is mathf.abs, for absolute value to make sure that the gravity is represented in a positive number. And using the derived equation that we got, because remember they gave us b squared over g, so we solved that to get square root of gravity times delta y plus the square root of delta y plus delta x squared. I'm gonna do that with mathf.clamp from 0 0.01 to max throw strength, because remember I decided that on the enemy, I want them to only be able to throw it so hard. So if we get back a number that's, let's say it takes 50 velocity magnitude to make it to the target position, our enemy's not gonna be able to do that. So instead, what I'm doing is having them still throw in an attempt to make it there. They're not gonna make it, but they're gonna go for it, right? What you could do is avoid using this clamp, just get back the throw velocity, check if the throw velocity is higher than your target max throw velocity, and then make the enemy do something like move closer or still throw it whatever you need your enemy to do, you can make some decision based on that. It's important to note about these equations that this is ignoring any drag, any air resistance, and any obstacles in the way. We're gonna talk about the obstacles a little bit later in the video. So now we need to calculate what angle do we need to throw this at because we just got a float velocity, right? So we need to convert that into a vector three initial velocity that we can assign to our rigid body to actually throw the object. And to do that, we need to know what's the angle. Then we can apply different proportions of that force to the X, Z, and Y axis, to make sure that we're gonna make it to that target. Since we're choosing the optimal angle here, we can use the simplified formula, not that huge arc tangent one. Instead, we can just do angle equals pi divided by two minus 0.5 times pi divided by two minus delta Y over delta X and Z. And that'll give us the angle that we're looking for. Now we need to create that initial velocity based on this angle and that throw force, right? Because we need to, again, make it go to a velocity that can be applied to the rigid body. That would be initial velocity equals cosine of the angle because cosine gives us the X value times the throw strength times the normalized X Z displacement because that gives us an appropriate allocated force on the X and the Z. Then we'll add in a sine angle times the throw strength times vector three up and that'll give us the strength to throw on the vertical axis because sine gives us the Y value of this equation. Back in the day when you were in trigonometry, probably your teacher was telling you if you want to calculate the X value, you use cosine. If you want to get the Y value, you use sine of the angle. The normalized X Z displacement that tells us basically the percentage of the force that should be applied to the X and the Z axis respectively, because normalized gives us a length of one vector. It goes maybe 0.5 X, 0.5 Z, whatever it is based on the displacement values. We're multiplying that by the cosine of the angle times the throw force. So that's going to give us the X proportion of the throw force is cosine theta times throw force. And we're gonna map that to the displacement normalized vector, which will then extend out that vector to tell us you need 11 on the X and negative 19 on the Z, whatever it is. The sine value, then we're doing the exact same thing with sine theta times the throw force. And then we're mapping that to the vector three up. Then finally, because we made this calculate throw data, we want to create a new throw data and return back the initial velocity as the throw strength the delta xz, the delta y, and the angle, so that way we can use that in any future calculations. If what we just did didn't make sense yet, please watch that section again. Look at the Wikipedia article. There's a link in the description below. It's really important to understand at least what we're doing, maybe not how it works, like how the equations work and all that. As long as you know what we're doing, the process, that's the key piece because we're going to use and build upon this in the rest of the video. That section is really important to understand how do we get that initial velocity and what that angle 
value is. Those are two critical pieces that if you don't understand, you're gonna have a hard time implementing this into your game. How you determine when your AI should throw projectiles is totally custom game logic for your game. In this video and in this repository, what I did was just made the enemy throw the ball after they've waited X number of seconds, whatever the attack delay is, if they have direct line of sight of the player. They're gonna throw this ball from one meter in front of them, one unit on the Z axis in front of them at the player. I do some resetting logic on the rigid body whenever they're gonna do an attack, make sure that we don't have any residual velocity from the previous throw. And then we start an attack coroutine. And the attack, we're doing it as a coroutine because first thing we wanna do is stop the agent moving because we're using nav mesh agents. We then want the agent to look at the target, at the player. Then I'm gonna wait a frame so that way both of those take full effect. The nav mesh agent has come to a complete stop and we've done that look at. Then we throw the object. So to calculate, where are we gonna throw the object? What I'm doing is taking the character controller off from the player. We're using a character controller here. You can change that to be whatever you want. I just wanted to make sure that we're hitting the midpoint of the player or we're targeting the midpoint of the player, not their feet. And that's all we're doing is passing in this target position as a player position plus the center point of the character controller, which is about one in this scene. The start position is the ball's position because that's again, one unit in front of the enemy. I didn't want to throw it from the enemy position because that's currently the midpoint of the enemy inside of them so then the ball would be stuck inside the enemy which would be weird so we're calculating the throw data with start and end points getting back some velocity right so then i'm going to call this function called do throw which just enables rigid body disables kinematic kind of basic rigid body management stuff and then assigns the velocity of the rigid body to be the throw data throw velocity that's important so that way the rigid body is actually going to go right that's the key line here is to use the velocity that we just calculated after the do throw, all we're doing is waiting a frame and then having the enemy go back to doing whatever they were doing before, which was just randomly running around the level. If we were to run it just like this, where we go in, hook up the enemy movement and the key references inside of the editor, setting up the attack projectile and some of the configurations like you're seeing right here and run it, we'll see that it actually works really well when the player never moves. As soon as the player starts moving, that's when we run into the problems because we're trying to lob something that takes some amount of time to get to the target position without considering what is the player doing. That's not particularly useful unless your player is incapable of moving or moves extremely slowly or you have extremely fast moving projectiles. So now we need to bring in a new layer of how do we calculate where is the player going to be in the future so that way we can try to intelligently target that new position that we think they're going to be at instead of where the player currently is. I want to give a huge shout out to all of my Patreon supporters. Every one of you is helping this channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people. And that means more people are making their game development dreams become a reality. If you want to show your support, you can go to patreon.com slash Academy, get your name up here on the screen, and get a voice shout out starting at the awesome tier. At the phenomenal tier level, there's Andrew Bowen. And at the awesome tier, there's Gerald Anderson, Autumn K, Matt Parkin, Ivan, Paul Berry, and Rulin. Thank you all for your support. I am so grateful. What I'm gonna do is just add an optional bool to say use movement prediction, that way we can toggle it on or off. And I'm gonna do a little bit of setup here. So we're gonna add in a new struct called prediction mode that has two options, the current velocity and average velocity. We'll look at those separately and do the current velocity first, because that's a little bit more simple average velocity later because that's a little bit more complicated. Also out of prediction mode, movement prediction mode. And before we actually dive into the implementation of this, let's talk about how do these work. So far we know how to calculate from a start point and end point what is the initial velocity required to throw an object to hit that player and at what angle we have to throw it, right? The problem now we have is how do we predict where the player is going to be at some time in the future? That's where we run into some problems because we haven't actually talked about time at all in any of these equations. You'll remember our friends, the kinematic equations, those allow us to solve for time when we know at least remember three of displacement, initial velocity, acceleration, time, and final velocity. Well, now we know initial velocity. So now we know initial velocity, we know acceleration, and we know displacement. So using the kinematic equations, we can come up with what is the time required to travel over this distance. We can use that to predict where the player will be in the future and target that new point instead. This is a little bit complicated and what we're gonna to implement today is not 100% correct because we're assuming the time it takes to go from the initial position to the player's position and the initial position to the player's projected position 
is the same amount of time and that may not be accurate. At the end, we'll talk a little bit about how you can compensate for this and some guidance on how you can try to resolve that. Player extrapolation is relatively complicated because there's just a lot of variables to try to consider and it's really guesswork because you don't know what the player's gonna do. So that's why we're starting with the simple one of the current velocity. This is gonna be a two-step process because we first need to calculate if we're gonna hit their current position and then we're gonna use that to help solve for time so that way we can then use that time to predict where the player's gonna go and calculate again, how do we hit that new point? So we'll grab the velocity that we got from the first calculation, set the Y to zero, because again, remember the XZ movement is totally independent of the Y movement. So we can solve for the time it takes to travel on the XZ plane to hit the player by taking the magnitude of this and divide by that velocity on the XZ plane. That's the Delta XZ divided by throw velocity without the y component dot magnitude. Once we know this time, we can take the player's current velocity from the character controller, multiply that by the time, assuming they're gonna keep moving at a consistent velocity in the same direction. We can add that to the player's current position and use that for the new calculate throw data as the start position, so that'll move them forward however long into the future and target that new position, still using the attack projectile as the start position. Then to use this, all we have to do is in the attack code routine, after we've calculated the throw data, check if we're gonna use the movement prediction. If we are, set the throw data equal to get predicted position throw data, passing in the throw data, and kinda it. If use movement prediction is turned on, we'll come in here, get updated throw data, and then do the throw. Back in the Unity editor, all we have to do is click that little button to turn on use movement prediction. It's significantly better. I can run left and right, and these agents are hitting me with the ball most of the time. The challenge comes if I start moving direction whatsoever from whenever they launch the ball, or if I'm moving on an arc, for example, because it's taking a snapshot of the player's current velocity at a point in time and just saying they're gonna go in a straight line that direction. We're not considering, hey, they're moving in an arc, so maybe I should hit it over here. Or we're not considering, hey, they're just moving back and forth really fast. Why don't I just target the middle of that and hit them? That works somewhat. It's a good fast calculation. We're not having to store a whole bunch of data or anything like that. We're just launching it, running it through these equations twice and we're done. That might work for some games, but if you want your AI to be more realistic, we need a better way, really. That's where average velocity comes into play, the other prediction mode. To support this one, I need to add four new variables. Based on the historical time and the historical resolution, we're gonna keep time times the resolution number of snapshots of the target positions. I'm storing these in a queue so that we can easily remove them in a FIFO manner. That's first in, first out. The historical position interval, we're gonna calculate based on the historical time and resolution. So that way we know how many seconds or fractions of a second we need to take a snapshot. So the higher resolution we choose and the higher duration we choose, that's gonna multiplicatively increase the memory that we have to store for each enemy of the player's position. So that, that takes up more memory and also makes it so it takes longer to calculate the average velocity because we have to iterate over more and more. If you've never used a queue before, it works very much like a list, but we're going to queue items to add them to the queue and we're going to dequeue them to remove them. What that does is it allows us to have, a let's say, a list of positions that we can have Whenever we say DQ, it takes the oldest one out and then we add a new one. It comes in at the back end of the queue. So that way we're always DQing the oldest position and adding new ones at the back. Once we have this history of positions back in the get predicted position throw data, we can check else whenever we're checking that condition about the prediction mode else, since we only have two options, we can calculate the average velocity of the player by summing the difference in positions assuming a fixed historical position interval, and then dividing the summed velocities by the historical time times the historical resolution to give us the average velocity. We can then set the player movement to be this average velocity and continue on exactly as we did before. Our player movement's now just going to be an average velocity instead of that snapshot. It's important to note here, since we're taking a series of snapshots of the player's position, that it's possible to miss really subtle movements depending on the resolution that you use. You can still get bad results, like what we had before. If your resolution is, I don't know, like five, that's only five per second. So if I'm moving with a really detailed movement, it's gonna miss a lot of that most likely. 
and my projection is going to be worse off. So the higher value you put here, the more accurate your projection is going to be. But remember, that's also more computationally expensive and memory intensive to store more of those. The historical time that you choose is also really important to think about because if you choose something like five seconds, there's probably going to be a lot of data in there that's not relevant to what you're trying to do. But if you choose something like 0.25, you might miss that the player's just strafing back and forth in the same spot. So choosing a value that makes sense based on your scene and your expected player movement will help improve the accuracy of your throws without necessarily making it more computationally expensive. There's one final thing I want to introduce here that's not really related to the movement prediction, and that's something I'm going to call the force ratio. Remember that when we're calculating theta, that's the angle we're going to throw this object at, we're calculating that because that's the least force required to throw the object to hit that point. Sometimes we'll be able to hit that same point at a lower angle and a higher velocity. That's what this force ratio is for, basically. We're going to add this to our script, and I think a combination of this and some ray casting and stuff that we're going to talk about in a little bit would be a good way to make it so your enemies will be able to throw stuff whenever they have limited height or if they need to go over some obstacles. So what I'm gonna do with this is have it be a value from zero to one, where zero is that optimal angle, and one is throwing at the maximum velocity that we've defined as that max throw velocity. Values closer to zero will, or if you put zero, then it's gonna calculate the angle exactly as we were using before, where it's gonna throw it at that optimal angle. And in some cases, that's not good because maybe the agent has limited height because they're inside the building and they need to throw it lower angle harder to hit, still hit that target. That's where the force ratio would come in. Values closer to one would throw it at the higher velocity and the lower angle. Whenever we're calculating the throw strength, remember we clamped it to 0.01 and max throw force. In a lot of cases, we're gonna have room between the throw strength calculated and the max throw strength that the enemy will use. So value of one will always use the max throw force and value of zero will always use that value that we calculated there. Unfortunately, the simple calculation that we used with theta equals pi divided by two, whatever, all that stuff, that only works to calculate the optimal angle. We have to use the scarier arc tangent equation to calculate it where we provide the force, where we know what that force is. So I'm saying force, I mean velocity here. Like when we know the initial velocity, we can use the arc tangent equation to calculate this angle instead of the simple one where it's going to allow us to figure out what the velocity is. So when the force ratio is not equal to zero, we're going to use this one instead. That it's float angle equals arc tangent of throw strength squared minus square root of throw strength to the fourth minus gravity times gravity times delta xz squared plus two times delta y times throw strength squared. All that divided by gravity times delta x and z. Okay, full project on GitHub, link in the description. You don't have to write that out yourself. That's the only change we need to make here. So again, force ratio of zero, we'll use that theta calculation. Force ratio, anything higher than zero is gonna use the scary equation and we'll calculate the angle based on a higher throw force. So just for fun, if we set the force ratio to be one and run it in the demo again, notice that agents that are far away are lopping the balls very high and the closer ones throw it much faster. You'll also notice that the movement prediction is less good because the force ratio is one, we're throwing it at a higher velocity, meaning the ball is traveling faster, getting to the target point faster than what we initially calculated, and so it's missing a lot of the times. Again, a little bit later, we're gonna talk about some ways to mitigate that, along with some other areas that you should improve based on this implementation to implement it fully into your game. You'll also notice that sometimes we cannot calculate an angle given the velocity that we have specified that will reach the target position at all. That means we need a higher force. You can easily check this to check if the theta angle is nan, and then we'll know that this isn't gonna work. You can just do something else, like maybe make you move closer, keep wandering, whatever it is. We've already talked about a lot of stuff. It's kind of a long video already, so let's Bring it in, let's talk about three keynotes. Let's not go further into this. This is, you can go really deep here. So let's just talk about the three key implementations notes I have so far. I've said it a couple times now, but in case you've been jumping around and you missed it, number one is the time it takes to travel to the player's current position and the time it takes for the projectile to travel to where the player's going to go may not be 
the exact same amount of time. That is an assumption built into our movement prediction so far, and we have not modified the throw strength or the angle or anything about that to accommodate for the new time that it's taking for our object to go from where it is to that target position. To resolve that, again, I'm not like super math expert. It took me quite a while of research to get us to this point. What I think we can do because the X Z movement is independent of the Y movement is we can scale the force we're going to throw to the new position based on the difference in time that it takes from our current position to the target position and from our current position to the player's current position. We can calculate the time it takes to go from start position to the player's current position and from start position to the new projected position based on the current velocity. We can do some solving with the kinematic equations here to adjust the initial velocity of that second throw, the throw to hit the projected position, to make it take the same amount of time as what we initially calculated here. That's where we're getting our projected movement for. We should be able to do that by rearranging some kinematic equations. And if you do implement that and it works out really well for you, maybe you can make a pull request so that way you can help out the entire community. Number two, in this repository, we're assuming that the enemy is going to only lob something whenever they have direct line of sight from where they are to the player. Since we're lobbing something, that may not make sense. You may instead do some ray casting and do some calculations, check if there's something in the way and lob something over a wall. That kind of brings us into number three. And we've talked about this a little bit already, that the theta angle that we choose is the optimal angle that will get us with the least amount of force from our start position to our target position, right? We might not have height space in the world to throw it at that angle. That's where we're introducing the force ratio, right? To avoid hitting the ceiling, that's where ray casting comes into play or spear casting if we're gonna throw something fat like these balls. A little while ago, I did a video about showing the path that a projectile will take using the kinematic equations. Since we know now enough to use the kinematic equations after these, what you can do is something very similar to that where you spear cast or ray cast along that path and see if it's gonna hit something. If you've noticed on the ascending arc that you hit something like the ceiling, you could then adjust the force multiplier, rerun those calculations, try again and see if, okay, hey, now I'm low enough to make it all the way to my target. The inverse could be true that maybe you need to actually arc it higher and you have the ability to increase the force throw at a higher angle to go over something and still hit your player. Both of these are feasible and can be achieved with ray casting or sphere casting. By the way, the other video I've got a link in the description, guard on the screen, you can check out that one to see how do we do that? Where's the ray casting? How do you draw the path? All that stuff. Whenever you know you hit something though, you kind of have to guess and check like, okay, hey, I went too high. Maybe let's come down by, let's increase the force by, I don't know, the force ratio to by 0.25, try again. You want to cap how many guess and checks you do before you move on because in one frame if you're going to do a hundred guesses and checks it's probably going to be really slow and there's going to be stutter especially if you have like 20 100 200 agents running around probably not a good idea cap it to a reasonable number of tries maybe you also cap that number based on the difficulty of the ai with all that said i hope that you understand out of this video i hope it helped you figure out how you can throw a projectile in your game from one position to another position, and also how you can maybe guess where the player is going to be at some point in the future and set you up with the tools to refine this better so it works well in your game. I hope you also got some of the pros and cons for each of the different projection modes and each of those strategies so that way you have a path forward to really make this good in your game. And while this can be taken off the shelf and you'll get okay results, I mean I basically made dodgeball right here. I wouldn't call this a fully production ready solution. Probably need to modify it some. I want you to use this as a base for learning and implementing into your game with a higher quality solution than what I've done so far. The full project code, as always, is available on GitHub. You can check out the repo, play around with it, fork it, use it as a foundation, any of that's fine. And if you did get value out of this video, please consider liking and subscribing to help the channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people. This new video is posted every tutorial Tuesday, and I'll see you next week.